We're going to just sit down here together and do the whole Phil Donahue thing. Do we get to pick the chair? Yes, whichever chair you like. Let's move this. I'll move this over here. Good. Well, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you. And, and thank you to the participants. Um, a lot of faces are familiar. Yeah. Um, like I said, we all have different pieces, but I think together we can take our hats off, throw away the boxes that we normally operate within, and, and really get creative here, I think. Well, great. I, I think that's, you know, the beauty of, the, of this group, obviously, is people from various facets have been invited here. Uh, and I know the National Academy is working with the sponsor, FDA, and working with our workshop committee, uh, try to delve into each of our worlds. And so you people out there have been selected. So at this point, be ready to come up with questions, discussions of this first presentation. And come, I'm first going to start off with this, this issue. You know, you and I experienced something. Right, and that experience really was kind of the scary experience of 2009 uh, H1N1, right? And, and, you know, I always go back and I love to, to, to give lectures about it because it really was kind of a scary time. Uh, I remember uh, Liz had just joined us, right, as a lawyer and, and, you know, and she came in not having been in this emergency response thing and it really was unsettling, wasn't it? Because we were moving at such a rapid speed. And, and yet you mentioned, you know, one of the overviews of, of your, you know, that one slide where you talked about the, the span of things. What did you learn from that experience? Oh, wow. So uh, specifically when it comes to this. To the topic, countermeasures. Right? To the, to the yeah. medical countermeasures and specifically, you know, the issue of, of, of assessing and monitoring. So, so for me it was the, the way everything just ramped up and the intensity with which everybody was coming together across the different you know, across the U.S. government, CDC, NIH, academia, pharma, everybody coming together. You sent me to CDC, to the Emergency Operations Center within those first few days, and the, the way that, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Contagion. The movie Contagion, and I can only do this by contrasting, the movie Contagion shows one aspect throughout the entire movie, and it really did get the epidemiology correct and the whole vaccine component to it. But what that movie was missing was the 95% of other activities and discussions going on with regard to what therapeutics do we have in the pipeline? What is the epidemiology telling us? What countermeasures are in the stockpile? What do we have in development? How might we be able to use those? What are already on the market? How are they going to be used? How are we going to provide guidance? How are we going to get information? How are we going to assess this new vaccine? So the tempo and pace and the, the collaboration to get this done and done well in a very, very compressed time frame was what really struck me. And yet you're frustrated. I mean, you provided this whole Paramavir, yeah. right, issue, which was at the time, you know, a major decision to be made. At the time, full no knowing that we didn't have the capability to actually find out how the stuff was, I, I'll use the term stuff a lot because I think it sounds kind of cool. Uh, how the stuff was going to be used and whether it's going to be effective, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what's the answer? I mean, I guess part of the answer is a workshop like this to sort of come up with, with ideas. And notice we're never going to be using the term recommendations from this workshop. That's taboo with this type of workshop and the arrangements that we have. So we're, this group is not going to come up with recommendations. It's going to be ideas. Actually, no, I'll use the term. We're going to come up with stuff. Uh, <laughs> We're going to do so, stuff so, to know stuff yeah, about know the stuff, stuff that's out stuff. there. But that being said, so where, you know, what's your idea? Okay, so let's say we release, you know, we have another pandemic. We have medication X out there. Uh, and what's your idea? What do you, how do you want this to work? In Carmen's ideal world, and mind you, this is Carmen's ideal world. Not sure you all want to be a part of that. But seriously, in Carmen's ideal world, we are using all the tools to very rapidly collect key information for different levels of decision makers about the medical product use. So for example, let's say, um, and we've seen some of this most recently, but let's say there is a mass exposure of something and we are providing countermeasures. Um, we find out the countermeasures that we're using may not be as effective as we thought. The countermeasures on the market are not as effective as we thought, and we're having to rapidly develop and deploy new countermeasures. 
What I'd really like to be able to do is collect information from electronic health records about the use of the countermeasure, understand from crowdsourcing how compliance, you know, are, are folks complying with the countermeasures? What is their experience with the countermeasure? I'd like to be able to use the, this information to detect, rapidly detect either safety or efficacy signals and or effectiveness signals and then rapidly use that decide okay we need to target this type of information and rapidly develop a protocol or have a protocol prepositioned and be able to rapidly conduct that study in the population needed to generate the information to continue that's the kind of ideal world where we flip the switch and we're using all the capabilities in a comprehensive strategic way. We're prioritizing the information that we need to gather, the information that needs to be put out there so that clinicians can make decisions on whether to continue to use a countermeasure, whether to switch a countermeasure. Government decision makers can make decisions. Do we release something else from the stockpile? Do we keep releasing the same product? Do we keep developing something else? That, that's the type of idea. And, and obviously you want this in a timely matter, right? I, I mean, this is all real time. I want it yesterday. Right, because it's the whole sense of, of decision making, and yet we live in the real world, yeah. right? So, you know, notwithstanding what does Carmen want, and I think this will be part of our discussion in the next few days, is what are we capable of at this point, and what do we need to be aspirational of, right? Because right now, for example, in the world of electronic health data, you know, we have, you know, even within the U.S. government, right, the inability of the DOD data to speak with the VA data, yeah. right? And, and, and that's been a multi-year process. Uh, does the, even the incidents of this past you know, few weeks, does wanna cry make you wanna cry? Sometimes. <laughs> right, because Sometimes. it showed a, a, a certainly a, a reliance on, on data out there and yet it's, it's potential, you know, uh, vulnerability. But we've also learned a lot. I mean, I do wanna point out, unfortunately, that timeline slide where it was showing we have more and more public health threats getting closer to 2017 and we expect more. You know, unfortunately, we've had uh, a couple of rough years responding to things with stuff. Um, we've had Ebola, we've had Zika, and with those, as we've responded to those, we've, we've advanced in the way that we think about this. I mean, when back in the day when you and I were, you know, running away from a dead goose, um, who would have thought of the concept of advanced product development in the midst of a public health response. Yet we are already thinking in those terms. We already have been doing that. We're already thinking about how to make that capability a reality and more of a mainstream way of, way of, of how we do things during public health emergencies. So we've learned, but, but we still have to look at how do we connect all these different pieces so that we can rapidly collect data from a variety of sources, aggregate the data, analyze the data, interpret the data, communicate the data, and use it. And yet in this room we have a variety of stakeholders. So let me sort of put you on the spot and basically say was, well, one aspect of this is you're the big Food and Drug Administration, right, the big and powerful. Uh, you're de de dealing with a big and powerful industry that is the sponsor of said product. You guys deal with it. So, you know, I, I think we've, I think over the last 10 years at least, we've done a wonderful job of really de-emphasizing who's the big and powerful and really coming together in a collective way, recognizing that each component has its own big and powerful piece to it and how we work together to bring all those pieces um, together. I think part of the difficulty and, and perhaps part of the difficulty with Paramavir is that you have all these different pieces that have their different priorities, that have their different capabilities, and the coordination or the overarching um, way we've come together to prioritize development and facilitate availability hasn't quite happened in the same way for how do we come together and prioritize the medical countermeasure assessment data, how we do it, where we do it, what's first, what is the critical information, who needs the information first, and how do we do it in a collective way. Great. So, so in essence, it's the big and powerful Oz, and the curtain is open. Yes. 
right? Which I think is a major metamorphosis, you know, being a former Fed, uh, is the sense that I think all these life experiences, right? And we'll start with, you know, years back, right? With the anthrax, you know, with, you know, uh, to a large extent, I, you know, Hurricane Katrina we throw into the mix that at some point there was this realization, and it's not really a cop-out realization, but it's a realization saying, you know, we can't really do it from the Fed's aspect alone, right? Nor are we pretending that we can do it anymore, right, alone. Nor are we the only ones on the hook. I mean, what part of the conversation that we've had is an acknowledgement that there are sponsors, pharmaceutical companies, others who have commitments to collect this type of information in a public health emergency, and how do we help facilitate and ensure that that can be collected and that, you know, if you have, for example, an anthrax, if we had an anthrax exposure, we have wonderful countermeasures that we have in our, in our stockpile, in our arsenal, that we expect them to perform well. We need to make sure and assess that they're performing well if we ever have to use them, and that's the time, the only opportunity we're gonna have to assess those. But at the same time, there are a variety of countermeasures that would come into play during that response. And if it's a large-scale mass casualty situation, how do we prioritize all the different data needs and requirements for that response? And how do we do that in a coordinated and, and rapid and, and integrated way? Great. We have about five minutes. We're going to try to keep us relatively on time. We started a little bit on the later side, and I have to run off to my daughter's graduation and giving a commencement address, believe it or not, shortly. So I, I'll be in and out today. That being said, we have about five minutes. Uh, are there comments, uh, criticisms, questions from the audience? The microphones are there, and we do ask again for you to name uh, your, your name and affiliation. And we'll have people walking around with microphones as well. So if you raise your hand, uh, anything in terms of reflection on this first session uh, and uh, specifically comments and questions. Oh, come on, there we got one, okay. It's always the first one is the, the one that makes it easy after that, so. Hello, my name's Dave Reddick. I'm with Biodefense Network. Um, I was interested in your after the final mile comments. Um, and in, in addition to helping local public health departments set up their closed pods, I manage a closed pod. And my responsibility is to get 50,000 courses of medication out to people within 48 hours. And if I'm going to be asked to do tracking of stuff, it's going to slow down my throughput significantly. How do you balance tracking of stuff with throughput? So that's, an, that's an excellent question. It's something that we've heard um, several times as, in, as we've, we, the, the monitoring and assessment working uh, integrated program team and working group preceding that, has, have presented, and, and that is, that's a very real concern. The, the goal is not to add more to what the, the, the responders are trying to do in terms of dispensing and, and getting things out there, particularly if we keep on the theme of anthrax and, and others like that where time is of the essence. Um, and that's why we had a working group that convened looking at the anthrax scenario as an example, as a case study and trying to track people receive the countermeasure in a pod, what would they do next? And what do we really need to know? Where is the information that we're trying to gather? And after about a year of deliberations, and, and we even had a team going to regional meetings working with um, certain stake and local partners to think this through, it, it occurred to us that if the countermeasure is failing or if the countermeasure is you know, if there's performance issues that we need to know about, that individual is very likely going to find his or her way into the healthcare system for care and treatment. I don't think they would go back to the pod, and if they go back to the pod, I'm pretty sure you're going to send them into the healthcare system for treatment. And so that's why we have focused a lot of the, the opportunities that, that, that might be on the electronic health record, on the healthcare system, and how might we leverage the information that's going to be there. Because you're absolutely right. It, it will be very difficult, if not some would say impossible, to add that type of tracking to the mass dispensing situation. And at the end of the day, that's not where the patient or the person is going to go that's having the problems that we want to know about. We have a question here, and then we'll go do a question back here. Yes, Shell. Uh, one of the things 
Hold on, we're going to turn your microphone on, I think. <laughs> My name is Sheldon Jacobson. I'm a computer science professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. One of the things I've noted in government is often different government agencies work on seemingly different problems, yet there are so many common aspects. And I think in this particular case, how the country deals with aviation security and threats attacking the air system and threats attacking the public health infrastructure, the parallels, I think, are quite striking. And I know within the TSA and DHS, there's a tremendous amount of data collection in anticipation of an extremely rare event. Has there been any thought in looking over the shoulder in DHS and TSA to say, can we learn something there? So, so we, we, we have started, at least within the integrated program team and then within the internal FDA team that's doing the FDA component of this, we have started asking ourselves that same question, not just TSA and DHS, but looking more to the, also to the health IT community and looking at different ways of collecting rapidly collecting large amounts of information, analyzing, distilling, aggregating. Um, that's part of why we're here. We'd like to hear your thoughts on how, from an all hazards perspective, we might look to some of these um, other experiences, other fields, and see what might be able to be brought to the countermeasure field. I struggled with my MCM 101 talk because normally I go very, very into the weeds about the type of product lines and the product classes and the regulatory requirements and the data needed. And I was hoping that the type of question that you're asking was the type of dialogue and discussion that we're going to stimulate. So I didn't want to get into that level of detail. Um, I'd be, I'm very interested in hearing over the next couple of days what your thoughts are about that. Great. We'll take one last question here because there's a red blinking light and I always get nervous when that happens. Uh, Charles Cairns. Oh, yeah, no, you're fine. Then we'll take one more because you had a hand up there as well. So go on. If you can hand the microphone to the woman right there and then you can have the last question there. Charles, you're fine. Just hold off a second. Stand and stretch. It's good for you. My name's Luann Lance and I'm with the New York State Department of Health. And I guess I'd just like to make a little comment about data collection methodology. Um, certainly you have to have the data in order to analyze the data after a medical countermeasure incident. And I think at the local and state level, we're really trying to transition into electronic data collection. And I think that it really is a perception that is sort of long coming. And instead of in addition to, it's instead of. This is the methodology you're going to use to collect the data instead of the paper um, to avoid any kind of duplicate data entry. And I think that that's really a transition that's sort of long coming, and it's also something that we need to sort of standardize that data collection across response activities and, and standardize the algorithms. Because ultimately, if you do your exercising and you, and you assess your throughput, what we found is the throughput is actually faster doing the electronic data collection and doing some of that in advance. But that's sort of a training um, issue that we have to work with the local health departments on because it's a technology fear, um, essentially. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And then the last question here right there. Uh, thank you. Uh, Charles Cairns. I'm Dean of the College of Medicine in the University of Arizona. And I also serve on the Academic Management Council of the Arizona Banner Health Partnership. I really like your integrated approach when you talk about operations, unstructured big data, EHR, and clinical trials networks. Because frankly, a lot's occurred uh, since the 2009 epidemic. Healthcare systems are now population health systems. And at Banner, for example, we are integrating care in safe ways uh, along with uh, uh, all sorts of electronic monitoring devices. In fact, 50% of our healthcare visits uh, at Kaiser next year, per the Princeton Economic Summit, are going to be electronic and virtual. So we're already connected, EHRs to personal devices, to big data approaches in multiple different settings. So I think your integration with operations and across these is timely. And we even with initiatives like the Precision Health Initiative, where we're going to enroll 50,000 folks each year over the next five years, 
have no integrated research. So I think the opportunities now for an integrated view across those domains, I think we should apply it to medical countermeasures and we can leverage this remarkable evolution of population management in healthcare system. Great, thank you so much. And I think we need to have obviously a more vibrant discussion on that. So what we're looking at I think in these two days is the great comments, you know, specifically about data, for example, from TSA, from, you know, bigger data sources, this whole idea of where we're heading with population health. You know, again, we're not coming up with recommendations, but one of the pleas I give you is by tomorrow, let's really dig into this, right? And we'll have opportunities in smaller groups, but, you know, let's really taste what we're going to produce from this group, right? As opposed to just another series of, of big ideas. So that being said, uh, thank you so much, Carmen, for being here. And now, station break. Laurel is coming up, and we're going to do the lightning rounds.